What are the biggest housing trends you're seeing among millennials? Anyone take it? Uh, I'll take it. So I think what we're seeing is a shift from just trying to find the biggest space for my budget to finding the best lifestyle, the best experience for my budget. And that's a lot of what we have built our platform around is like, don't just build a regular boring apartment building. Instead, tell a story that makes them feel like they're going to live their best life in that building, um, which has been very different from sort of the institutional multifamily world. What is the story? Uh, the story. Uh, you can live in a building where you don't need to belong to a private gym like an Equinox or an LA Fitness. You don't need to belong to a WeWork. You don't even need to leave. Like you can make friends here. You can work here. You can connect with like-minded people here. And ultimately, your career and health like, will thrive because of the apartment building that you chose. Yeah, you know, I, I'd say you know, what we're seeing from our you know, core customer, it's a, you know, a cash-strapped consumer. Um, there's just a trend towards people um, obviously valuing experiences o o over things, and we're trying to cater to them. But you know, the number one pain point we're trying to solve for is affordability. Um, so you know, the way that we can solve for that pain point specifically is by focusing on the design of the space. And you know, if you want to compare you know, housing to a consumer product, which is really how we think about, about you know, the world, um, if you look at it through that lens, housing is the largest consumer product category in the world. And if you think about um, rent as a consumption item, if we can eliminate square feet, we can eliminate monthly rent. So we can then um, take that, uh, use that as a marketing angle, and then deliver different items into the, into the unit, into the consumer. Um, you know, another thing that we're seeing is that there's this, there's, there, there's this hunger for community and sense of belonging. So what we are very focused on is, is delivering the right type of programming within the unit and within the building um, to continue to attract uh, and retain our, our residents. Yeah, what, what we found is that millennials are traveling twice as much as previous generations. Um, they're much more experience oriented. So we're trying to bring that to the buildings that we occupy. So what that means is that rather than having uh, participating in the amenity arms race that a lot of multifamily developers have uh, done over the last 10 years, we're much more focused on having a few different amenities that are uh, done well. So a pool that's done well, a gym, perhaps a communal room that has a, a chef's kitchen, and then bringing uh, experiences and events to those amenities. Um, they're also focused on having more of a global environment uh, within their building, meeting people from different parts of the world, uh, because that's something that is very interesting to, to them when they then travel. Um, I think millennials want convenience. Um, I mean, you know, if you look at a lot of other consumer product categories, like it's everything has just become easier, whether it's Airbnb kind of finding a place to stay or, you know, ride sharing with Uber. Um, and that hasn't really affected real estate. And so that's really, you know, like we look at our product as a consumer product and we want to make the user experience as seamless as possible. And so at Common, um, you can rent a co-living bedroom for, let's say, $1,300 a month. Um, and that's, that's an all-inclusive price. And so that includes a weekly cleaning service, that includes furnishings, that includes utilities, Wi-Fi, um, shared goods. So we provide the toilet paper, paper towels, hand soap. Um, we have community events. And so people just pay one flat rent a month. Um, they don't have to worry about anything else. They don't have to worry about splitting bills. They don't have to worry about buying furniture. They don't have to take a day off work to... Um, wait for the cable guy to come. And so I think that's, that's been a really kind of compelling aspect of um, tweaking residential real estate to, to fit today's renters' needs. Andy, you mentioned that um, affordability is obviously an issue and co-living can, can help alleviate that problem. Um, Miami is one of the most rent burdened cities in the country. What impact do you think co-living could have on affordability in a market like this? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's... I think it's pretty well known that if you can rethink the design of, of the space, you can then deliver um, a better price point, a more attainable price point. You know, what, what we're seeing, um, our, our view is one of the reasons there's an affordability issue in a lot of these markets is it's because zoning code and building code and um, it's just antiquated laws. And we think every time a building goes up, it's essentially you know, antiquated because there's been massive shifts in consumer tastes, preferences um, over the past 40, 50 years. But um, you know, the, the product type has not changed. And, if you're you know, an institutional investor, you have to get a certain 
you know, untrended you know, return on your, on your money. So therefore, you, you're going to back into what that implies for monthly rent on an oversized unit. So obviously, the, the price is going to be you know, unattainable for, for the masses. Um, so you know, we are focused, you know, Common as well, we're, we're focused on working with cities, you know, educating them on what the co-living product type is, how this can alleviate a lot of the pressure you know, in the market and open up a more, you know, a, a, a better product to the masses. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, your point about Miami being the most rent burdened city in the United States is absolutely true. Like 60% of residents in Miami spend more than 30% of their income on rent, which is a pretty staggering statistic. Um, and so I think co-living just offering housing, like high quality, good housing at a lower price point very much has um, a place in the Miami real estate market. Um, and I, you know, as um, I, think, I think a lot of cities are recognizing this. Um, so we are working with New York City's Housing and Preservation Department to um, basically create policy around co-living as affordable housing. And so in, you know, New York has to, New York City has to build 300,000 affordable units by 2026, and they are recognizing co-living as an avenue to achieve that. Um, and so it's really, you know, it's really great to um, get this, you know, just institutional acknowledgement and get the city's buy-in on co-living as a unit typology um, and just, you know, build kind of regulations around that. What areas of Miami are each of your companies looking at or expanding in? Uh, so PMG is heavily invested in downtown Miami. We have, we have X Miami, which was the first real rollout of our co-living platform. And we're currently building at uh, 400 Biscayne right next door, another 700-ish unit project, uh, as well as another one in Wynwood. And so we're very focused on sort of center of town, Maine and Maine, the most desirable locations, because uh, that's where we think people want to live. How is X Miami doing? Fantastic, right? So for us, there's a big risk. It was the first one, right? So it just, now it's stabilized, so we can, it, for us, it proves the model of showing all of our investors and other partners, like, you can actually have a lobby that's open to the public and has, like, food and beverage operations in it. You can put roommates together, and they're actually going to pay their rent and get along. You can get away with doing event programming. It actually is great for the deal. It brings people into the project that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. And so for us, it's really become this showpiece that is allowing us to now scale nationally? I mean, we, um, we follow our demographic. So uh, that, you know, the average renter at Common is around 29 years old. They make between 50 and $70,000 a year. Um, about 45% are new to a specific, are new to the city that they're gonna be living in. And so where's that person gonna live in Miami? Um, and so we, you know, we try to kind of think about it that way. Um, so, you know, we're, we have projects under development in Little Havana, in Coconut Grove, um, you know, Wynwood, um, we're looking at North Beach. We think that's a very compelling market. Um, North Miami, downtown. So um, yeah, it, it, it's a market that we have a robust pipeline in and, um, and are, are looking to just build that exponentially. We have a bit of a 80-20 model. Uh, about 80% of our units are in prime, core downtown, Brickell, Miami, uh, South Beach. Um, the other 20% are in uh, Coconut Grove, Coral Gables, Wynwood, uh, Bell Harbor, um, Fort Lauderdale as well. Yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're looking really, really in most markets, you know, whether it's you know, prime uh, or transit-oriented location, if there's you know, a reason for being in you know, our, our thesis has been that this is going to work in a high cost, low cost market. As long as you can deliver the right product at the right price, your product's going to fly off the shelves. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in, in you know, a few of our locations right now um, that are, you know, one of which is, I'd say, it's like a B, B plus uh, location. And, you know, we're, we're trying to think about how can we broaden the definition of co-living. And, you know, our, our demographics range from, you know, right out of, you know, college all, all the way, you know, people in their 70s. Leasing, leasing our units. And you know, we, we think the reason for that is really because if you can deliver the right product at the right price and thoughtfully design and program uh, the, the space, that is really going to open your product up to, to the masses. How do rents compare to the traditional apartment versus a co-living you know, bedroom or a studio? It's a lot lower. Um, so we price um, a co-living bedroom at around a 15 to 20% discount for a studio in there versus a studio in the area. 
Um, and so if, you know, if you're in a market where a studio costs Sixteen or seventeen hundred dollars, and we are pricing co-living bedrooms at twelve hundred to thirteen hundred. That represents a pretty meaningful discount in terms of headline rent. But then, if you take the next step and think about what that includes, um, so the thirteen hundred dollars includes weekly cleaning, furnishings, utilities, Wi-Fi, and so if you're comparing the net real estate cost of living at common in a co-living bedroom versus living in a studio by yourself, um, that's around a thirty-five to forty percent discount, um, which is very val you know compelling proposition to the renter. How do you, how do each of your companies use technology to increase efficiency and, and uh, reduce costs? Uh, we do it a few ways, right? So one with access control, right? So we developed a mobile app that allows anyone in the building to open any door from their phone. So we don't need to do key handoffs and you can also invite guests. So if someone's coming to stay with you for the weekend or you have a dog walker, they can now access your unit through their phone without management needing to step in. Um, other things we do is package lockers, right? We're all suffering from Amazon Prime and a, a deluge of packages. And so we actually found that the smart package lockers work very well if you can hold the couriers responsible for actually putting the packages in them. But it is pretty seamless in terms of packages getting in there, Residents getting an alert, taking it out. If it's in there too long, they get a notice. If it's not out in the next few days, there's going to be a fee or it's going to get returned. And so we found those two things, which is sort of eliminating handing off keys and managing packages, have freed up tons of management resources. Yeah, you know, we've built um, a resident app, a resident portal, so people can really control their lives, pay rent, maintenance requests, things of that nature. Um, and you know, our core customer, you know, we're a, we're a tech-enabled business. Our core customer um, really expects that. Uh, from us today. And that's why I think there's such a, an opportunity right now in the marketplace. Um, we've also built a roommate matching uh, platform that helps facilitate the formation of a household ba based on compatibility, kind of like a, like a dating app. Um, so we're always trying to think about how can we remove you know, friction points in the resident experience and then how is that going to translate to, you know, to the operating costs on the building? Yeah, we're, we're heavily tech enabled. We have about 200 uh, engineers that program a variety of different uh, tech systems for us that we have all in house. Um, this is anything from checking in, checking out, uh, smart home systems that are completely customizable for the guest or for the resident, uh, concierge services, any errands or tasks that we do internally, all those are done through our own um, in house apps to ensure that our, our teams can get to where they need to get to as soon as possible to, to service the residents or the guest. Um, it's, a, it's a huge component of our, uh, of our business and will continue to be. Um, yeah, I mean, technology is really at the heart of Commons operations. So more than 10% of our employee base are software engineers. Um, so, you know, I, I think one obvious area where um, technology has a very meaningful impact is in how we do leasing. So leasing, um, so somebody will come to Commons website, they will put in some basic information. What is their budget? What is, you know, what city do they want to live in? And somebody will, somebody on our inside sales team will call them back in five to 10 minutes. Um, and that has an incredible effect on conversion um, as opposed to just waiting four or five hours. Um, and then we do a lot of virtual tours. And so we will determine if that person is actually in the city that they want to rent in or is looking from another city. Um, and so today about 27% of leases signed are done through virtual tours. Um, and if they're doing an in-person tour, then by the time they get to the building and tour with a leasing person, the conversion rate is significantly higher. So today, about 60% of live tours um, result in leases. And that's a, that's a super high ratio. And so what that means for building operations um, is that your OPEX is lower because instead of having three people um, on, on site as a leasing specialist, you probably need two or one and a half. And so that just, that, that has a, a very direct increase on, or sorry, direct impact on um, your operating, a building's operating expenses. In terms of co-living, how does it work um, when you're matching roommates? Do, do, do you guys do that? Do your companies do that? Or do the roommates choose each other? How does, how does that work? Yeah, we, we don't want to be in the business of telling people who to live with. So that's why we utilize technology to allow the residents to you know, essentially discriminate against one another. Because you know, as the operator, we, we can't be in that business. But there's nothing to suggest that you know, residents can't pick who or who they do not want to, to live with. So we're trying to make that process as seamless as possible. So you fill out you know, a survey of you know, several questions. And you'll start to see what your compatibility looks like with different people that are you know, within your budget, similar 
uh, move-in dates? Yeah, so we take a slightly different approach. So instead of solving um, kind of roommate issues on the front end, we solve it on the back end. And so I would say Common has, um, we, have, we have sort of three lines of defense for um, any roommate conflict. So first is we just reduce, like we identify upfront um, what roommates fight about and we just try to solve that upfront. So, I mean, what do roommates fight about? They fight about, you know, who, like who's going to clean the kitchen this week? How are we going to split the bills? If somebody moves out, who's going to take the furniture? Um, and so we solve all of that upfront so people just have fewer things to fight about. Um, the second line of defense is we have an entire member services team. And so their job is to, their job is literally to problem solve um, whatever people, common members are upset about. Um, and so that could involve roommate conflict, although, um, you know, just a, about like one to 2% of all tickets that we're, we receive are actually roommate related. So it's actually much lower than people think, but um, that's, that's their entire job. And so they kind of talk members through conflict resolution. Um, and our last line of defense is you can move anywhere in the common network if you're really unhappy. So if you signed a 12 month lease in New York and in month three, um, you decide you're unhappy for whatever reason, you can transfer the rest, the remaining term of your lease to um, another bedroom in the same building or another apartment in New York, or um, if you get a new job in San Francisco, then you can transfer to San Francisco. Yeah, I think we similarly started with how can we make living with roommates better, right? So everyone gets their own bathroom. Like the hard parts are, I don't want to share a bathroom with a stranger. Who's got the furniture? Like I have a TV. Does he have a couch? How's that going to work? Um, we have split the bills. Everyone's Venmoing each other at the end of the month. So for us, we said if we furnish it, give everyone their own bathroom. We split the bills for you. Everyone has their own le uh, lease. There's just a lot less sort of opportunity for problems. Um, with fair housing, everyone who wants to apply for effectively a unit right, is, and qualifies if they have the income and the credit and pass a criminal background check, they can go into that unit. And then we facilitate a roommate intro just to take all the anxiety out of who's going to show up, right? The, the awkward part is they just show up with a suitcase and say, like, hi, I'm your roommate. So you know, we'll arrange for them to get coffee or get a drink beforehand. And then everyone also signs a roommate code of conduct that just covers sort of good roommate stuff. I'm not going to borrow your stuff without asking. We're going to talk about cleaning up a lot of the things you covered. And we generally find that people who self-select into co-living are generally, like, they understand what they're getting into. No one's forcing them into it. And they tend to street, uh, treat strangers you know, better than they would even treat their friends or relatives. And so people like, are really nice to their roommates that they have to wake up and see in the morning. Um, but then on the like, very rare occasion when there is a problem, you are allowed to relocate within our building uh, up to two times in the first six months. And then at that point, I think it's happened once, right? It's probably just not the right fit. I know X Miami was really the first new co-living project here in South Florida, and you're working on um, more projects in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. What did you learn from X Miami, and how will you be doing it differently in the future? Um, so we broke like everything of institutional multifamily with X Miami. Right? We we didn't build a management office because in the spirit of community, we wanted all conversations and all management to happen out in the open and really like be part of the community. But that, that turned out not to be the best move, right? Our team needs a quiet place to work. Residents sometimes need to talk about sensitive issues that require privacy. So like, we, we won't be doing that again, right? We're gonna make sure next time we have that. Uh, and then also with the event programming, we're sort of glad to find out that People actually don't want to live in a building that's all parties, especially all late night. And so we learned that there's much more interest from residents and people outside the building in a lot more wellness related and career related events that are like, frankly a lot more wholesome. And so we definitely have dialed back sort of the party super social aspect and made sure that all our programming is a lot more meaningful and that's better for our business and better for the building. I would echo that. I think that's one of the things that Common has learned, um, just how to handle community and event programming. Um, so to date, we've opened uh, 32 projects across the US. Um, and so I think over that course, we've had a ton of learnings. Um, one of them was on how to handle community. So when we first started, we used to, it was a very heavy handed approach. We would say, everybody come have, you know, we're gonna have a potluck dinner on Sunday night, everybody has to come. Um, and so, we found that like people didn't really react well to that because it felt like Common was a camp counselor. Um, and so what we did was um, 
two things. So um, one, we brought events out of the homes and we made them citywide. And so right now in New York, um, you, you know, every, everything goes through the Connect by Common app that every common member has. Um, and so we'll do events in, you know, at Chelsea Market in New York or, you know, so, you know something um, that brings people out of their homes and gets to know other common members in that city. Um, the second change that we made was we let, we let, uh, we let residents create their own events. And that's actually been a super prolific channel of community events. So um, they can go on the app. It's super easy to um, create an event and publicize it to everybody in your, in your, in your home. Um, and that's a much more like organic way for people to come together and bond. Co-living is fairly new to Miami. Um, and I know that it's still early on, but I'm curious when you're dealing with multifamily landlords and trying to get leases signed, um, do you find that there's a lot of competition? And, and also for Marley with Sonder. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we are the landlord, right? But it, like co-living is just basically like living with roommates rebranded, right? So the way that like our buildings are marketed, right? The units are still on there on Zillow and Trulia and on the MLS with everyone else. So yes, it's a super crowded market, but people aren't necessarily finding us looking for co-living. They're looking for like a, a place to live downtown for 1300 a month. And it's just product market fit, right? We're pretty much the only game in town, which is how we arrived at co-living in the first place. It was all about like, creating attainably priced units in a class A luxury building in the best locations. Yeah, I would say competition is uh, quite high in the alternative accommodation space. Uh, you have short-term rentals, um, co-living, housing as a service. Uh, there's a variety of different products that are going after somewhat similar real estate. Um, it's, a, it's a low barrier to entry business, but it's a very high barrier to entry high barrier to, to scale business. So I think you'll see a lot of co consolidation um, uh, and there'll be a few kind of lead players in each of the spaces. Yeah, you know, I, I'd echo that. I'd be, I'm typically bumping up into the, to the same groups when we're looking at an opportunity, um, which I think is healthy right now for the, the space, it gives more credibility and validity, um, especially from an institutional investor standpoint. Um, you know, it allows us to, you know, provide more data points to show that this is not just a, a fad, it's you know, actually here to stay. Um, and it's just an extension of, of multifamily. And, you know, I, I think if you think about a world in which there's only one hotel flag, that, that's a little strange. So um, within the multifamily space, it's, you know, multiples the size of hospitality. So I think there's plenty of room for, for a lot of operators. But, you know, I mean, I, I'd echo his sentiment that it, it is, um, it, it is difficult to, to scale. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I echo the scaling points. It is a uh, um, so I, I definitely think we will see consolidation in um, in the next three to five years. Um, I mean, as far as competition goes, I think yes, there is competition. There's certainly more competition than last year, but it's it's a big market. It's a big opportunity, um, and so I you know and I you know what we're seeing these days is a lot of large institutional developers looking at co living less as an asset class. So they're not saying okay, I want to build a an entire co-living building. They're looking at it as a unit typology. Um, and so a lot of developers are coming to us and saying, um, hey, I'm going to build a thousand unit apartment building. Um, I'm going to build studios ones and twos like every other developer does. But um, I also want to build some co-living because co-living is, it just gives me access to just, it, it lowers the um, entry point into my building. It gives me access to a lower price point market, which is actually huge. Um, and I don't want to leave that on the table. And I get to boost my rent per square foot while doing it. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of that. And we're seeing just institutions and large developers just really kind of warming up to the idea. So I think even though there is increased competition, um, the size of the opportunity is getting bigger every single day. In terms of um, short-term rental operators, Marley, I wanted to ask you with Sonder, um, what do the daily or weekly rates, how do they compare to, you know, your average hotel or even your competitors? Yeah, so we're, we're generally priced about 10% lower than a, a typical hotel, um, a quality four star. We'd like to be priced, uh, we'd like to get there with them, but they have the loyalty programs and a variety of other, th the distribution that we're, we're working on, we're getting there. Um, but we also like the fact that we're uh, a little less expensive, even though you're getting two to three times the, the real estate. Uh, Francis, who's one of our founders, 
always likes to say he wants it to be um, irresponsible not to stay with us. Uh, we want the value to be so tremendous that um, uh, it's the only logical decision. Are there any um, cities or neighborhoods within South Florida that that your companies avoid because of maybe zoning issues or um, you know issues with with governments? Yeah, I think for all of us, it's really important uh, to be 100% legal. There, it's it's in some cities, it is kind of the wild west. A lot of people are taking apartments illegally. Um, the Airbnb situations in the press a lot. For us, we spend a tremendous amount of time with the cities, uh, zoning attorneys, city planners, um, really everyone in that space to make sure that in uh, all of our units are 100% compliant. Um, there are some, in some cities, we need to be simply uh, hotel zoned. Um, uh, and so we'll, t we'll do that in a city like New York or San Francisco. In other cities, it's viewed more as alternative accommodation um, so in our short-term rentals, uh, it varies by city. In our long-term stay, uh, we can go into pretty much any multifamily building. Are there any markets that, that any of you avoid? or? I wouldn't say we avoid them. I think, um, you know, like Sondra, before we enter any market, we do a very detailed zoning analysis to really understand all of the code regulations and make sure that we conform to residential zoning and code. Um, and so in Miami in particular, you know, the, the regulations for um, the city of Miami are different than Miami Beach. And so I wouldn't say we avoid either of them, but we just adapt our product to fit the, fit the regulations of that sub-market. Yeah, and yeah, everything we do is you know, as of right or, or by right. And our, our process always begins on the zoning. We have in-house architects that are going to figure out, you know, what can we do? What can't we do? How can we optimize the, the density of the floor plate that's going to deliver higher return on cost, you know, a very marketable floor plan that we think is going to attract, you know, the, um, you know, the masses, of, you know, our, our core customer, our demographic. Um, and we're always also thinking about the adaptability or the flexibility of the floor plan. So if the strategy if it doesn't work, if the next buyer doesn't want to do this strategy, um, if, the, if it becomes a better condo market at some point, you know, how can you, how can you flex that unit back such that there's a, there's a different use at uh, a different time where it might be a higher and better use? How would you say the, how strong is the demand here for, for co-living? Uh, you know, we, we think it's high, right? Our buildings are leasing them faster at more per foot than any other building in the area. Um, and again, I would draw, stress it's less about the label co-living and more about the price point and the amenities that they're getting with it. Um, but feeling I mean, confident enough that we're doing 5,000 units in the next three years all focused on this and you know, now the big banks are lining up and trying to like give us debt in our projects whereas two years ago we were having to tell a lot of stories about like it's going to work it's starting to happen it's the next wave right now sort of when the guys in the suits are actually lining up to try and put money in it makes us feel like it, it's been proven you know I think it's I think it's insatiable if you can deliver at the right price point that's obviously going to attract uh, you know, a lot of demand. And, and then, you know, secondly, if you think about, you know, the, the building itself, the four walls, if you think about the programming of the space differently, you know, through the events, the community, the, the services you're providing, um, you can always, you know, curate or, or, or cater to a specific cohort or demographic. So, you know, we, we more think about ourselves as, as an operating system within, you know, within the hardware, within the building. Um, so that allows us to, you know, turn on or turn off certain types of, you know, events, um, different branding, programming, uh, and figuring out how, how can we target, you know, a specific uh, group. Yeah, I mean, our, um, I mean, demand on the consumer side has been pretty tremendous. Um, so right now, you know, nationally, we have a little bit, a little bit north of a thousand beds um, across six cities. We are always 98 to 99 percent occupied. So at any given point, you're probably going to have 20 to 30 vacant bedrooms um, at Common. Um, for for those 20 to 30 bedrooms, we get 17,000 applications per month. Um, and so I think on the consumer side, there is, there is really, really strong demand for, for this product. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is like co-living is not, it's not new. Like people already live with roommates. And so if you look at the rental stock in Miami and look at what percentage of that is actually leased to non-family member roommates, that's, you know, that's in the high single digits. And so um, people already live like this. And what Common is doing is... Um, 
professionalizing it, elevating it, um, and just creating a consistent branded experience for that because it's a lot of people live like this. A lot of people will continue to live like this. Um, and so we think it's a, it's a very like enduring niche asset class. Okay, great. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Can you guys talk a little bit about how you structure your deals with landlords, maybe not as relevant to PMG since you're the developer, and then also the value add that you're bringing to landlords? Um, be interested to hear about that from the operators. Our model is very much a master lease model. Um, so we pay market rents on long-term leases from three to as long as 10 years. Um, the, the value for the developer is tremendous. There's no vacancy in our units. There's no turnover cost. In a, in a situation where we take the entire building, there's no property management. Uh, we'll take on the repairs and maintenance. There's no leasing costs. There's no advertising. Um, so the, the net to gross uh, for your NOI is in the neighborhood of 85%. Uh, it's, if you look at it as a comparison of leveraged NOI, it's almost doubling. Um, so the economic value is, is, is there. Um, and we provide us uh, essentially mailbox money. Um, with a stabilized lease you know we we have not done master leases we've been just due to experience we've seen that the lenders prefer um that you know as a startup if we're going to encumber an asset uh they're typically not going to provide you know attractive financing so we structure our deals as a management agreement modeled really after hotel management agreement so it's a fee model and the, you know the benefit to the owner in that scenario um is such that you know if we can really create this you know this massive spread relative to a traditional multifamily uh, ownership maintains the lion's share of that upside, and yeah uh, you know using our our building in Long Island City in, in Queens as an example, you know we occupy the lower one third of that building, so we have 422 beds in that asset. One floor is two to 16, 17 to 40 are just traditional market rate uh, apartment studios ones uh, and twos. Um, net of our fees and net of the incremental expense to deliver the services. Uh, we're adding 30% more to the bottom line. And um, you know, that asset, uh, there was a trade there. Uh, and the, in the investor that stepped in didn't you know, ding our NOI stream relative to the conventional apartment. So that, that incremental 30% implies, at a multifamily cap rate, implied about $30 million of incremental value that we generated. Uh, yeah, common structures deals very similar to Ollie. We do, um, we do a lot of management agreements, which I would think of as kind of a hybrid between a property management agreement um, and a hotel flag agreement. So we, um, so it is a fee-based model and we, um, the benefit to the, to the owner is you just get more high, just more NOI. Um, and so if you compare a well-designed, dense, 100% co-living building versus um, that same building envelope for a traditional unit mix, then your NOI ends up being around 15 to 30% higher than traditional multifamily. So there is a, you know, it's co-living is a great way um, to bump your yield on cost. So if you're having trouble kind of making a deal pencil, you're getting to a 5.8 and you need to get above a 6.5, then um, adding co-living is a great way to do that. Yeah, I mean, just if it's interesting, right? So the, like the brand story of how we started our multifamily platform was when, we were looking at three years ago, looking at the market of co-living operators and the scale of our buildings, which is generally 300 plus units, 500 plus beds. At the time, it didn't feel like hiring sort of one of the a co-living manager to run what is like 80% traditional multifamily building was going to make sense for us. So we made the decision to start our own brand, um, and then you know the pieces of sort of the more brand forward pieces of the business, which are sort of all leasing operations and all event programming, we decided to handle out of corporate. And then we hire sort of a traditional third party property manager to collect the rents and maintain the property. What size of building do you guys prefer? So for example, if I have a 200 unit building that I need to participate in this kind of a project, would you take something like that on? We do residential zoning. Did you say type or size? size. Si yeah. From a size perspective, we're in buildings as small as five units. We're uh, in buildings as large as, uh, we're looking at 360. We have 345 about signed. Um, we have several that are over 200 units. Okay. I mean, we, we build buildings, let's say it's 300 to 700 units. Of that, we are probably going to have someone like a Sonder 
right? Master lease, say 10 to 15%, which as he said, works out really well for us, especially starting out. And then about 20% of the building will be co-living. So three and four bedrooms where you know, we're furnishing it and find the roommates. And then the rest largely studios, one bedrooms and market rate, two bedrooms. Sorry, I misheard your question. Um, so on size, so our, um, so our ideal size in terms of, you know, our world is in terms of beds. Um, so I would say our ideal size right now is around 300 to 500 beds per project. Um, and so, you know, I mean, we start off small. So we start off with some, you know, some, you know, some buildings that are like 20 beds. Um, but our, some of the largest projects in our pipeline are between like 600 to 800 beds. I mean, um, I would say our, our threshold is like, we won't go, we'll try not to go below like 80 beds. Um, and we're, we're, we're exclusively focused on larger scale you know, institutional assets. Um, you know, the brain surgery that goes into doing a five unit versus 500 unit isn't, isn't that much different. So it's a better bang for our buck. We, we also want these, these buildings to be billboards for us, good you know, marketing engines for us. Um, and typically with a larger asset, you get you know, more amenity space, more networking the amenity space within our portfolio, um, which we think, you know, just enhances the brand. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll add, we found, say, like, under 200 units, we, we just don't get the critical mass of space and people to, for us, really deliver the promise, right? I can't hold, like, 40-person yoga events in a 100-person building because we need turnout that we're not going to get, right? So, and also, it's hard to get spaces that are really, like, built for Instagram in a smaller building, uh, which matters. Just so I understand how it could work with investors, if I have a client that um, wants to buy a building for co-living, would you guys come on board to help him analyze what type of return he could get on this? Or, or you guys come with them and, and as partners? How does it work? Yeah, you know, we're typically, in, we're, we're typically doing mainly new construction deals and we have we have an house design architect team um and you know we're involved in deals where you know sometimes there's not even a schematic design so we can help our developer partners from every step of the process up until there's you know we get cfo and we can we can take the keys and operate and on the capitalization side too we have you know we can help with the capital as well yeah so i would think of um Common as almost like a co-living design advisor who is going to be part of your development consulting team throughout the life cycle of the project. So, in uh, so I, I would say there are kind of two main types of deals that we work with. Um, so the first is ground up development, and so the ideal time for us to get involved is during pre-development. So I, right after you've acquired a site and you're trying to figure out what is the highest and best use of the property, then um, we have about a thirty percent design or a thirty person um, designing construction team that will advise on how to lay out your co-living units and um, how to program your amenities and um, you know just what, what what is the right unit mix between co-living and traditional if it uh, if if the developer prefers that um, and so and then you know as the as the development happens through design development construction documents um, actually you know actual construction then we're there kind of every single step of the way. Um, the other kind of route that we work with partners on are existing buildings. So you have, um, you know, so I think especially in the south, the southeast, you have a lot of apartment buildings that were built in, you know, between like 2010 and 2015 that are just large. So you'll have like two bedrooms that are 1,300 square feet. Um, and so we'll work with develop, we'll work with owners in that capacity to see if we can densify their building. So maybe turn some of the two bedrooms into three bedrooms, um, rent out by the bedroom, and then suddenly your rent goes from you know twenty eight hundred dollars for a two bedroom to forty five hundred. Um, and so that's super accretive. And so we've been um, we've been also pushing that model as well. My my question is quite similar, but uh, for the operators in the group. Would you partner with the property owners to manage and convert existing buildings into short-term rentals to meet the requirements of the city, like in Miami Beach? Yeah, we've done that quite often um, uh, across, the, across the U.S. And, and in Europe as well. Um, we have a lot of office conversion properties. I would say probably somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to 2,000 units. Um, we have our own in-house teams. We have 35 interior designers. We have architects. We have... Uh, fit out specialist all in house that can uh, work with you to, to help with all that. It sounds almost too good to be true. Like WeWorks is about to close. 
are you guys profitable on a daily basis or is it the future profit that you're looking at? Yeah, I can, I, I, we've gotten this question a lot recently. Um, I can only speak to, to Sonder, but uh, the WeWork financials are significantly different than ours. Um, their contribution margin was somewhere in the neighborhood of negative 6%. Ours is, in eight, ours is 18%, um, which is a tremendous difference. Uh, the, from a cash flow perspective, we're losing a little bit of money still. That's entirely due, that and then some is entirely due to expansion. We're expanding to 15 cities, mainly in Europe and uh, the Middle East right now. Um, we make sure that we have a full team set up in advance before there's any income. Um, what I can also say is that any city where we have 100 units or more, uh, we're profitable, including paying for the overhead of that city, um, which is a very low threshold for us. We have about 10,000 units. Um, so 100, 100 units is a pretty low threshold. So it's very, very different uh, than we work. Yeah, I mean, the underwriting for our projects looks and smells like a class A downtown high rise multifamily building, right? With the one small caveat that in our three and four bedrooms, we get more per foot and there's more units in them. But you know, in terms of how we raise money, how brokers potentially take our buildings to market, it's very much represented like a, like a traditional building. Um, it's certainly not easy, right? Too good to be true. Like managing big building and managing big apartment buildings is really hard, but underneath like all the sizzle of calling it co-living, like there's still largely apartment buildings. Yeah. I mean, our balance sheet is completely different than WeWorks, um, mostly because we don't do long-term master leases. Um, and so in our portfolio today, we have, we have a small number of master leases. There's you know, I mean, dollar wise, they're small, but like we primarily do management agreements. And so our business is fundamentally a fee business. So I would think of commons business as almost analogous to like a, a four seasons. Um, and so we, um, yeah, so I mean, liability wise, we do not have a heavy balance sheet. Um, so all of our, um, you know, basically all of our revenue go, goes towards headcount and, and growing the business because we have, you know, we have, we have 12,000, we have 12,000 beds in the pipeline. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it's, 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 it's a pretty financially conservative business model today. What kind of market do you guys see uh, more growth upcoming? I heard you say you guys are going in Dubai and uh, other countries, but do you see this working mostly for millennials um, here in the States or progressing eventually as he asked to make a business? It sounds too good to be true. You know, you know, for us, th this is such a massive market. So right now we're focused on a, you know, relatively, you know, small cohort. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that if you think about just the, the programming of the space, if we're the operating system within the, the building, if you change the way that you're thinking about the programming, um, the services that you're providing, uh, we can target, you know, students, seniors, families. Um, so there, there's, there, there's a massive opportunity here. Uh, and I think, you know, the crux of it, though, is also if you just show that you care a little bit more as the operator of the building, you're going to be able to drive a significant amount of amount of demand. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that the, the age, income and credit score in the co-living components of our building are all higher than in the sort of traditional for our studios and one bedrooms. Right. It's it's not a, a stream of 22 year old digital nomads that it's appealing to. Right. We have. Like in ex Miami, like lots of flight attendants, lots of consultants, people who just really are attracted to the convenience, but have like very successful, very steady careers. Uh, and we're also working hard to be more inclusive with the branding to make sure that like everyone feels welcome in this building. Uh, and are, we keep kind of pinching ourselves and like, wow, like there really are 60 year olds happy living with 22 year olds and it just works. Yeah, for us, our, uh, our average age is just under 40 years old. It's 39 years old. And um, I think the, the, how we look at it, it's very much convenience option. So there is that uh, appeal to millennials where they're just looking for a turnkey service because they want to be out uh, living their life experiences. But then we also have the um, empty nesters and, and retirement uh, community where they want a turnkey service 
um, they're retired, they, wanna, they don't want to deal with, uh, they want the services and the convenience of the concierge and those types of things. Yeah, and we are, um, you know, so for, for co-living, which I would say is, which is our core product, um, there's a ton of runway. I mean, like if you just look at the monthly demand numbers versus um, the supply, I, I, I think there's a lot of room for growth. So we've really just been focusing on expanding throughout the U.S. Um, we're going to be in 21 cities and we want to grow in all of those cities. Um, but, you know, I, I understand your point that this, you know, this model could apply to other demographics. And so what we're doing is building out different brands. Um, and so we're, uh, we launched a product called Kin um, back in April, and that is a product specifically for young families. And so it is, it's not, it's not co-living in the sense that families are not sharing apartments, but um, they are apartments that are specifically designed and operated for young families. So, you know, parents who are between 30 and 40 years old and who have children between the ages of zero and five who still want to live in a city. Um, and so that's what that product is. Um, you know, that's, that's a project product we launched in April and we're doing um, our first project in Philadelphia and have another one in DC coming. Um, and so that's, we think that's another huge area for growth. Um, and then another avenue that we've been exploring is workforce housing. Um, I mean, that's very preliminary, but we think that there's a kind of big market there as well. Well, thank you. It sounds like this could be a potential solution to the homeless situation that we're having throughout the nation. If you guys are working with cities, it sounds like. So congratulations. Um, I feel that one of the threshold, let's say, for new developments, especially here in Miami and Miami Beach, is zoning. So um, I don't know how easy it has been for you guys to work with them as far as not just you ad adapting to the existing rules, but having them to accommodate a little bit to a different concept, which is what you're offering at this point. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've found that cities generally want to make it work, right? Like they realize there's an urban affordability crisis and that a lot of this zoning isn't meeting the needs of their constituents right? and are realizing that if they can't find paths to creating affordable housing, then they're not going to have jobs. So I can say in Miami specifically, like, there's always hoops to jump through, right? Like just the mailbox setup like breaks a lot of what the world was built on. And so like you got to refigure that out. But we have really found that if you are transparent with what you're trying to build rather than like kind of being sneak asking, you know, doing it and then hoping you don't get slapped on the wrist, that generally they're supportive and want to be a part of it, right? Like politicians want to be at the ribbon cutting for innovative new projects that are creating like attainably priced units as opposed to being roadblocks. Yeah, and I think um, I think what's happened, you know, I, I think what happened um, in in North Beach over the past year is is a great example of that, right? So North Beach, um, they're trying to revitalize the town center, and they're trying to, you know, create more development there, and they they're using co living um, as a way to as a way to catalyze that and instigate that and energize that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I agree. A lot of city governments um, are aware that there's a big affordability crisis um, and that co-living is a potential solution to that. I mean, we're seeing that in a very official way in New York City. We've seen that in, in North Beach and Miami. Um, we're seeing that in Atlanta. We're seeing that in San Jose. We're seeing that in New Orleans. Um, and so I, I think it's, um, yeah, city, cities are very, like spiritually very on board with the idea. Great. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next year.